everyone. Tonight our hangout is on glass in a surgical setting. Glass in emergency medicine. And I have several glass explorers here with me tonight and we're all going to be talking about our ex exploration of glass in medicine. And for those of you who are new to our hangouts and new to glass, just so you know, this is Google Glass and um, it's being field tested or um, beta tested right now by several explorers and we're going to be talking about how it's being used in emergency medicine. We have several guests. I'm going to start and let them each introduce themselves, tell you a little bit about what they do for a living, how it fits into emergency medicine, and where they're interested or curious about glass and emergency medicine. So we'll start with you, Chris. Could you introduce yourself to everyone, please? Oh, we're not able to hear you. All right, can you work on sound? I'll tell you what, we're going to go straight to Jason. Uh, can I introduce you so you can be there and work on sound? Can I introduce you for now, Chris? Because I think maybe he doesn't have a, any sound. So um, actually, I tell you what, we're going to go to Jason Kruger and let him introduce himself. <coughs> and um, if you don't mind, you can probably introduce the both of you, can't you? I guess I could. Uh, Chris Vukin over there, he's uh, CEO of Evermed, Team Evermed. I'm Jason Kruger. I'm kind of working with him and Patrick, who's down the line there. Uh, trying to work out ways to increase easy access to vitals and mapping and uh, other types of sensor data when en route on a call. And yeah, that's about all I've got. Great. Jason Wagner. Uh, I'm an emergency physician. I work at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, I am one of the associate residency program directors, which means I'm in charge of resident education, so taking the baby doctors that graduate med school and don't really know anything and trying to turn them into the doctors you want to take care of you when they finally graduate our program four years later. Uh, I also um, am the director of what we call augmented learning, so that's our simulation center and kind of the area where we do uh, adult alternative uh, education modules and things like that. Great. And Patrick. Uh, yes, I'm a career firefighter and EMT, and I'm also a developer that I've been working on Android uh, application for a while, and now I'm working with Glass to uh, bring incident information to first responders. And I'm also working with Chris and Team Evermed, developing applications with them. And Ron. Hey, good evening. Ron McCready from Strong. Uh, Sterling, Virginia. I'm the uh, president of Sterling Volunteer Rescue Squad. I'm also an EMT. And most of my focus right now is trying to bring glass to the paramedic for that first hour and integrate that with, as mentioned before, sensors and the, the technology that we carry in the back of the ambulance to primarily assist the paramedic and uh, relay that data to the doctor, to the medical control. Great. Thank you, Ron. Well, before we get started, I want to tell the audience that is listening, I'm hoping that we're able to um, have the questions app working for us today, that we're testing out an additional um, ability to our Hangouts tonight. So if you're watching out in the audience and you notice that there's a yellow bar below that says ask a question, then in that bar you can ask a question and it will show up to our right. Um, I'm not seeing if it's working out there, but if it is, then go ahead and throw your questions our way and as we get to it, um, we'll answer your questions. So let's get started with um, several of you uh, have been wearing glass and, and taking it with you in your jobs and exploring. What is the general response that you get from the people around you in the emergency environment? What kind of response are you getting from them? Anybody? Uh, I, I guess I'll start for uh, the silence that fell upon us here. Um, <laughs> So it's certainly that it's limited in its utility right now in the emergency department, mainly because of HIPAA concerns. So uh, we actually have all of our patients sign a, a, the registration form that includes that their their video and, and and photo images may be captured for educational purposes. So anyone that signed that form, I feel comfortable bringing the device in and actually having a conversation with them about it. Um, you know, short of that, if we have people who are unconsentable, then it becomes a little more limited. I think that's the, the main t uh, difficult thing to get over right now is 
is making people comfortable with what you're trying to do with the device. Everyone thinks that their medical complaint is going to end up on your Facebook page or something like that. Uh, so trying to alleviate those uh, those fears and concerns and then trying to use it to actually educate the doctors who are taking care of them. Do you find that it's difficult to to get the patients to participate or are they mostly willing and curious? Um, I would say 50-50 right now. You have the, the conspiracy theorists who really think that this is just going to go out into the ether and everyone's going to get a hold of it. And then you have the, the other half who are really interested in helping uh, teach doctors how to take better care of them. Anybody else have experiences that they want to share? Have you all been have been bringing them to work? Have you had firefighters and first responders and paramedics take a look at it and talk about ways that it might work? Yeah, I wear mine at work um, pretty much every day I'm on, on duty. Um, I can't wear it on EMS calls just because of my chief and all the HIPAA concerns, obviously that's an issue. Um, but generally the guys that I work with and other firefighters, they are really interested in it and they see a lot of uses for it. And although it's not quite at that point, there's a big potential there. And I think most of the people that I let demo it, um, they're excited about the possibilities. I think it's pretty easy to get a demo and, and display it to people and, and once they handle it and check it out, they're pretty cool with it. Uh, but just running around with something weird on your face, it, it attracts attention still. I don't think that the awareness of the product is out there yet. Kathy, I think... Uh... Oh, go ahead, Chris. No, that's okay. I'm sorry. What I was going to say was, I think, as Jason Wagner pointed out, um, the interest in education this is probably going to be the best venue to really get the most visibility in using glass in the um, fire stations, in the squads, in the ERs, in a training setting where we can practice scenarios. Practice either with a dummy, with actors, so to speak, where we are acting out this uh, scenarios, and replay that data for um, other students, have students wear it, and go through it and record it and play it back for uh, training purposes. Yeah, yeah. I want to just tag on that briefly. Uh, we do a thing with all of our residents called, they're called standard uh, patient observations and we're, they're required to do so many a year and what happens is you actually sit in the room with the resident which creates this completely artificial environment while they evaluate a real patient. And I really see glass as a powerful tool for that, where I just put a pair on their head and a pair on the patient's head, and I say, you know, take care of your patient. And they record a video that we can later then put together without the... Oh, no. Uh. <laughs> right in the middle of a thought. A great like thought. Like Solo. <laughs> okay, well, while, while he's getting unfrozen... Um, well, it seems like there is a, a common theme here then because the last hangout that we had, uh, this is strange now, my picture is gone. The last hangout that we had was talking about um, glass in a learning environment, medical learning environment, and it sounds like that's a common theme, that glass is a really good way to use as a tool to get insight into the people that are learning and the people who are teaching and to see how things are being done right and wrong, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. And he's back. But, but I think the other side benefit to that, Kathy, is that's where people start to get familiar with the technology. Um, they get comfortable with it, and they start to see the opportunities in a training scenario to go, well, maybe we could use it over in this situation, and we could work the protocols for that one. Um, but I think it's in the training that everybody starts to relax a little bit and then opens up their minds to think outside of the, the constraints that they were in previously. I think that's a great point. You want to elaborate on that? <laughs> I was giving Chris a chance to speak up there. But yeah, sure. I I, um, I got to, yeah, go ahead, Chris. I was just going to let Kathy know that as far as um, clinical stuff, 
So I've moved out of the clinical area as my primary um, practice field and into development. So my time in the actual hospitals has been much more limited than these other folks who are still in a day-to-day -day kind of environment where they're working. Uh, I spend a lot more time designing and building, uh, collaborating with folks on projects as opposed to direct patient care now. Uh, coming up, though, um, next week, we'll be filming uh, four surgeries um, and then actually pulling patient data from an EMR and displaying it for the surgeon on glass. Um, so we'll see what happens in that kind of environment. Um, but I did want to touch on the, uh, the point of, like, what happens when you bring glass into people. Um, so all the folks that I've shown as far as medical related uh, physicians, pharmacists, those kind of things, uh, as soon as you put glass on them, it just kind of like clicks for them. And they're like, oh, <laughs> I could use it for this and this and this and this. And it's just like an endless string of things that they're like, this could make my life so much easier. So while there are definitely problems right now as far as like walking straight into a live environment and implementing a glass-based program, um, Ron's definitely right, you know, if we focus on the labs first, so like with CPR glass, we'll focus on, you know, training in a lab setting where you're on a you know, CPR dummy, and then slowly roll out of, uh, uh, you know, some kind of level of comfortability with the product, and when you first put it on, it takes a while to uh, get used to it, you know. The first couple of weeks, I, you know, Heads-up displays have always been a really sweet thing, and I thought they would be so good in medical practice. But when I got this, um, the first probably three weeks, I thought, well, this is a great, you know, kind of fun toy, but as a long-lasting form factor, I'm not so sure. But the longer I spend with glass, the more I think that this is really a viable platform to replace the paging systems and all the interactions that, you know, typically occur on a, you know, minute-to-minute -minute basis in a hospital. You can document drug administration. You can, you know, scan meds. I mean, you can capture vital signs. It's just, it's such a handy platform. But there are definite concerns, and, and oftentimes the number one concern is HIPAA, privacy. How difficult is it to build into Glass that privacy so that we're not having to worry about every application having to go through 10 levels of approval in order to be used? Is that even possible? Absolutely. Um, so currently, you know, SSL encryption is required by HIPAA. Um, as long as you're not storing any data anywhere and it's SSL encrypted from endpoint to endpoint, we're okay. okay. So that's currently how the HIE structures are working. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure why there is such a negative amount of press out there and focus on HIPAA relating to just glass um, because glass is just like any other phone or tablet that's in the hospital environments you know um, there's safe ways to use those tools in those environments that are already established and we can build on those established platforms with glass so there's not a there's no real hurdle <laughs> with HIPAA and glass in our opinion and I, I think there's there's this concept that uh, you can somehow uh, uh, covertly record what's going on without me knowing. And it, it, once you put glass on and you see, like, when you see the little screen glowing over my eye, you know that I'm documenting what's going on. <laughs> it's a no-brainer. And the chime. The chime is not something that you can ignore. It's not like the sound that plays through your headphone. It's a loud chime, and, and people can hear it. Bring. Everybody. It's great. So one of the main benefits that Google emphasizes about Google Glass is its hand-free ability, its ability to communicate without having to have your hands to dial a phone and to take pictures and to run a camera and all of those things. So one of the obvious areas that I see as a strong point for Glass in emergency medicine is communicating what is on one end of an emergency so that the people on the other end of the emergency are ready to respond. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And has anybody played around with how that might work? Everybody's silent. We, we <laughs> haven't played around with it yet, but where, where I really see it is a, a potentially integral part of the pre-hospital world melding with the hospital world is stroke. Uh, you know, the, the NIH stroke scale is uh, 
a somewhat tedious tool to apply, and there's you know Cincinnati stroke scale, some of the the EMS centered stroke scales, where if if uh, a stroke center could just see that part of the exam in the field, they could maybe decide like, okay, this patient needs to go to a stroke center, this patient can go to the nearest hospital. So to be able to actually participate in that evaluation would be really critical, I think, is you know here at WashU we we have a, a pretty high or false stroke rate because we don't want to miss a stroke. Mm -hmm. And if you could just cut that down a little bit and cut out some of those visits and CT scans, you could increase your throughput a lot and take care of the patients who really need your attention. Good point. Absolutely. And GLASS provides a great opportunity, in my opinion, to develop continuity of care from the field to the door. You know, Whether that door be your emergency room or the endpoint door of admission somewhere on the floor. Um, there's no reason why that data can't flow right from where Ron's picking it up when he's, or Jason or Patrick, are picking it up in the field, you know. Um, there's absolutely no reason whatsoever other than our systems are not designed that way. So huge opportunity, huge opportunity to just transform the way care is applied. Well, I've often thought too, what about recording a person when they're they're at their worst so that when other doctors see them later and the drugs have kicked in they can go back to see how non-responsive that person was and I know that's a that's a real taboo subject to think about recording something because then it's out there for lawsuits and anything else but assuming that, um, that can be approached addressed what were you gonna say Chris I'm sorry I don't know if anybody else has ideas here but I absolutely agree especially with seizures um, think about a neurologist who can't be there in ER and see what's happening with that patient that's not responding to 5 or 10 milligrams of IV Valium and they're still seizing and it's like well do we start a dip drip or what you know so I think it's a very good tool to provide that visual evidence to people that say hey this is why I made the decision that I made you know I, you know I, I do worry about it a little bit in that realm if we, we get to the point someday where documenting everything you do to a patient vis video from a video standpoint becomes the norm and yeah. uh, especially working in an educational environment uh, I, I get concerned about that patient pulling up their video a week later to see the intern who really had trouble with their central line and you know they're bleeding everywhere and the interns asking for help and you know, the attending comes in and gets the procedure. It, you know, there is sometimes uh, the concept of too much information on, t on occasion. I know it sounds really negative to say that, but no, no, no. Th things look a, well, a lot. Right. Things can look a lot worse than, than they are in reality sometimes. You know, when in the patient care setting. Yeah, I, I think that we've got kind of a lopsided thing going on right now, where uh, you could turn on a news station and see live coverage and know more about the scene, the victims, <laughs> and the dangers going on than medical control or the doctor who's going to be receiving that patient. So we using glass and, and sensor data and other you know other ways of just sharing that information through the system at the same time, I think those are very key things to chase after. Has anybody had any conversations um, to find out when I think about using glass from a remote standpoint, if you're in a remote site and you have you need some expertise. You don't want to tap into somebody in an emergency situation and there's a doctor on the other end. Right now I notice that the vision of the camera is the picture that I see is really not that clear. So could you really use it in a in a, a medical setting? Would it be accurate enough and, and is it possible to upgrade that camera? Has anybody had any thoughts or discussions about that? Am I the only one who's one of them? I, I think glass has to be the the reporter in the field. That's their tool. My tool back in the emergency department is a screen, a television screen, or a, a computer screen. You know, the the camera shoots good enough resolution. It's the display isn't high enough resolution for me to really get much out of it. But if I have a you know a 27 inch monitor, then that's what I need. That's a good point. I hadn't thought about the fact that you could have uh, be relaying information and the, the receiver doesn't necessarily have to be receiving it on glass. Good point. But so, no, well you, bring, well, you bring that up, it's one of the shortcomings of glass that I've contacted Google about from my perspective, and that's a procedural perspective. I've been trying to record procedures that 
that we're doing in the emergency department for educational purposes. And the the glass sits kind of at just kind of an upward angle from your field of vision. And then when you when you put that, I mean, here, I guess I can wear them to demonstrate it, but <laughs> you know, so. And then you, you put this little obstruction in the view of the, the doctor and the tendency is instead of looking down at what they're doing, they want to avoid looking at the screen so they look down with their eyes. And so when I, when I look at all these procedures when they're done, I get like half the field of what I want to see. So I've contacted them about just kicking the bows up a little bit so the camera gets canted down so it more closely mimics your direct field of vision. So that's an area where, where I'm going to end up customizing mine so it does that because I've got like half an airway and half a central line and I've got all these cut off videos that are kind of useless. Either that or the, uh, the camera starts tracking your eye and what and focusing where the eye is looking. Say that again? It, it'd be hard but down the road where the it's able to track where the eye is looking and then focus the lens on that. Oh, right. That'd be great. With a little wink. What do they call that? The wink? The winky That's thing. The, yeah, if you look at the Google Glass on the inside, there's a spot. They call it the wink. Wink. Um, what is that called? It detects yeah. when your eyes open and close so that you can take a picture by winking. Yeah, yeah. it's called winky, and it's the light and sensor data that it gets off of that little slit right there. Yeah. But I'm, I'm sure that the uh, moving camera that you're talking about, Ron, that's probably version 3.5. Yeah. It'll be on top of it. <laughs> well, it would really be nice if there was another access point that you could rotate. You know, we have the horizontal, but why can't we do the vertical on, you know, the glass piece here? Because, right. I don't know. They talked about that in one of their development videos, that at first they had, you know, they felt that it was over, you know, uh, angled or whatever. You could do too many adjustments on it. But I sure. think to make it down to one is kind of, I mean, come on, at least give us two axes to play with. Well, one of the, the solutions to the camera being too high that I've heard from some of the explorers is they actually put pads, little sticky pads similar to the nose sticky pads that you use, mm -hmm. um, and they put them there to raise them up so it does tip the glass a little more down, and that seems to aim the camera a little better. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to end up doing that. All these I, also, I, I wear my glass less than my residents do, so they all wear it, and I, I, get, it a, I get it on weekends only, weekends and holidays, you know? Mm -hmm. Nice. So where do you think, we, if, we could, if we could have everything we want, and w realistically we could get, all, get it to do all the things we want to do, where would you like to see glass in emergency medicine? On every provider's head. <laughs> Doing what? Would you want it? Well, obviously, we, we talked about this. We don't want it to record everything right now. We're not ready for that, right? <laughs> well, I'd like to see it, like we've already talked about, um, for first responders and the paramedics in the field. Um, the situations arise where sometimes they need further medical direction, and they'll have to contact a doctor and use it. It's done via the radio or telephone. Um, and that would be a great tool if they could also see the patient and their symptoms in firsthand. Do you think we could get to a point where someone as a first responder, an EMT, could be wearing this and a physician on the other end could talk them through doing things that right now they might not necessarily do? Uh, possibly. I think, I mean, the it's not a good place for training, and it's not going to walk through any kind of really complicated procedures. But um, you know, maybe in some circumstances, sure. Sorry, I'm having some sound issues here. Um, we have we have a. I've opened up the hangout to people who want to participate to ask questions. So if any of you who are watching outside are interested in joining the hangout and joining this discussion look for the link. I did put it in my stream. Um, it is the link that actually brings you into the Hangout. So we are going to have people start joining us now and I'm going to post that again if I can. Um, we have one guest here. I'm not sure. Are you able to hear us? Ad Adme? Is that how you say your name? Hello? 
All right. He just wants to participate silently, I guess. So, <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, so we have just a little bit more time here, and I want to get into the specifics. Are any of you working on anything that you can give us um, a taste of what we might see once Glass is released? Uh, I would say, you know, one of the one of the simple fixes we're working on right now is just checklists in uh, emergency medicine. So uh, if anyone's ever, you know, read the checklist manifesto, it's pretty well proven that checklists for uh, critical procedures or even routine procedures can make a big difference in patient outcomes. And uh, checklists in particular for what happens in emergency medicine, which are rare, rare occurrences that have devastating consequences. So, you know, you, you may have graduated from an, an inner city residency program and you may have done three or four thoracotomies where you end up, you know, cutting open someone's chest and clamping out the aorta as a, a life-saving procedure, but you might not have done that for six years and you, you might not have done it at all in your new hospital. So having some sort of refresher right in front of your eyes about the things to think about um, can be really critical in those those procedures you don't do on a regular basis, and so that's one of the things we're working on right now, is to create checklists for both common and rare procedures. Are those checklists set? Are they are they a standard checklist, or are you looking to build that those checklists? Uh, most of them have have a pretty uh, a pretty well accepted uh, checklist system. There you know there might be a few variables here and there, but for the most part, they're they're accepted standards. Now, the one thing that I, I would love to see Glass get that it doesn't have yet is the ability to, uh, to detect motion uh, in front of a visual field. So if, has anyone used the Leap Motion Controller yet? I haven't had a chance to check it out yet. It's, it's pretty awesome, and it's just this little, this little box about this big, and you set it in front of your computer, and it does really good 2D recognition of your hands. And I envision, like, if you had a Leap Motion Controller built in to glass where I wouldn't have to contact it at all with my hand. And, and that's where not only can I have a checklist in front of me, but I can actually manipulate it and display it without touching the, the bow of the glass because that's one of the things that in you know some of our procedures, many of them, we have to stay sterile. So, you know, now or suddenly... Or basic one, for gestures. It, mm -hmm. it, yeah, exactly. So I, I can swipe across and things like that. Um, if The way glass is now, I'd have to, you know, sterilely prep something across the whole side of my face if I wanted to use glass. So uh, if I wanted to manipulate the checklist, you know, instead now we just display it and we don't manipulate it. I think we're probably pretty close to having, you know, the functionality we need to use voice commands uh, to navigate most of those kind of things. I can really see glass being used kind of as a complete EMR entry tool as well. Um, you know, capturing all your dictation and uh, you can review labs and orders, place new orders, all that kind of stuff right from your device. Um, the problem I have with well, glass and, and voice recognition though, Chris, is if I'm in an environment where there's any kind of noise, it disrupts my ability to drive glass. Whether it's someone laughing in the background or a child sneezing or crying or the tapping of a fan, I can't drive glass and I can't dictate if I've got that sound. So when you put glass on, do you normally pull your hair back and let the mic sit right on your skull? It doesn't sit well on my skull right now. I have a small head mm -hmm. and so it's hit or miss on sound for one mm -hmm. thing. And I have lots of problem with dictation if I'm wearing my glasses and I haven't pulled my hair out of the way. It's not very uh, accurate. You're right. So. Um, I have to, especially when I'm, you know, demoing for doctors and things, if they've got hair in the way, I have to make sure that I explain that, hey, you need to, you know, pull your hair back, you've got glasses, see if you can sit them out of the way as far as possible so this mic sits right on your skull. And then it's literally really like 99% accurate, which is <laughs> crazy. It beats the I crap on Siri, I'll tell you that oh much. Oh my gosh, right? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if anybody saw my post, but I don't usually have problems with it. Once it does hear me, it generally hears me correctly, and the only time it didn't was when it was, I tried to say something about cyclist porn, and when I said cyclist porn, it came across as cyclist porn. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> you wonder how those results get so high in their uh, algorithm list. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I would love from an EMR perspective to be able to go into a patient's room and interview them 
and and have it basically so document our interview and then just feed it back into the EMR system. Basically, be my scribe. You know, that's yeah. that would be fantastic. Make the scribes go the way of the foggy whip. You know, and why not code in real time too? I mean, come on. You're right. If if you know how to code, <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> uh, let the computer do it for you. <laughs> I wish that worked. Now, a couple of months ago, I had a hangout um, talking about node technology. And uh, for those of you who didn't watch, the node technology, ha it has a sensor that can detect everything from gases to temperature changes, color changes, motion. Um, and we were discussing how that might work with glass. And one of the obvious applications there would be someone like a volunteer firefighter or someone who's in an emergency setting where they might need navigation out of a building, they might need to know if there's another earthquake tremor coming, a, a post tremor or whatever you call those, um, if gases are leaking in, in a building where they're trying to rescue people. Um, have any of you had any thoughts of how that might work or go into play as far as those additional technologies that might be integrated into glass? I, I personally am in looking forward to the Scanadu Scout and getting that Bluetooth functionality going on. I, I'm not aware of the node that you're talking about, but I really, really want to get that data real time, you know, right there and be able to log it. That would be really important, and it would make uh, vitals that much easier and relaying that information upstream to wherever that patient is going to end up um, and simplifying, you know, after, after incident paperwork and care. Can you repeat what you said, the something scout? I, I'm not familiar with that. It says, it's called the Scanadu Scout. I'll post its link in the chat. And so really, afterwards, if we can get it on the event page, um, I'll if you put it in the chat, I'll throw it onto the event page. Yeah, this is a product that I'm really looking forward to. And so basically, what, what does it do? Uh, so it's a three-point contact sort of deal, and it analyzes your electrical ry rhythm. It can sense your temperature. Um, it can gather your blood pressure, um, all kinds of stuff. I, I guess I'd have to look at the specs page to it's be able to be there. It can capture uh, 10 vitals in 10 seconds, basically. Yeah. Pulse, yeah. respiration, core temp. Um, it actually does a, or can do, I mean, Obviously, it's not FDA approved yet because it's an Indiegogo project, but it can give you an actual EKG strip. <laughs> it's pretty uh, pretty advanced. It's going to be an entrance in the uh, Tricorder X Prize uh, competition. Now, here's an here's an interesting question. It was brought up in the early days of Glass, and and I'm only partially understanding how this all works. But there is a a Tax change, I don't know if it's related to Obamacare or some other kind of health care reform, but there is a device tax that people are concerned with that if a an, if an, uh, piece of equipment is used for medical, I think it's diagnosis or something, that it can then be taxed and it causes that item to cost more. Has, has anybody talked about the concerns of turning glass into a medical device or using one of those other technologies with glass and, and having it be redefined as a medical device that then requires a taxation? I've read a little bit on that subject. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, um, I wouldn't be so concerned with glass right now, I don't think, but um, watching Apple's event today and the integration of that M7 processor, that kind of brought to the forefront my mind that you could really start to be concerned if you're developing on the Apple platform that you're going to have FDA regulation because they're saying that that sensor is designed specifically to capture medical data. That is a valid concern. Yeah, that's it. I mean, kind of right, right along the lines of what I was going to say is it's I'm not concerned about the tax. I mean, the, the companies charge enough money for their products as it is. A little tax isn't going to make a dent, a dent in their pockets. Uh, but the FDA is a major pain in the butt, for better or for worse. And uh, once you have to start going through the hoops of FDA approval, it, it's a whole new ball game. So I, I would see it as glass doesn't become the device. It's the accessories that become the medical device, and they'll find a way to keep those two separate entities and uh, they ran into this with, uh, I worked with a developer for a portable ultrasound system and uh, they would they made the probes uh, and then 
you would plug them into a cell phone and it would allow you to to send ultrasound data over the uh, the cellular network, so great for third world countries and things like that, developing nations. The problem was that they had to get FDA approval because they sold it as a package. So they, they could only choose one platform because the whole the cell phone had to go through FDA approval. So it, it did limit that because they made it a package instead of two separate components. Hmm. I didn't realize you could separate them and, and avoid that. That's just a, a thought of that's some of the concern that has been flying around regarding healthcare and glass and, and even some other technologies. So I was curious if that had been a discussion. So does glass get a general thumbs up uh, sideways or a thumbs down as far as healthcare applications of emergency medicine? I'd say um, thumbs up, right? I agree. Thumbs up. In its current state, I'll give it this with lots of potential. So, <laughs> so. I think it's got I think it's got a great chance at bringing data to everybody quickly and sharing it. I think it's a great tool. I mean, yeah, and, and from my perspective, like the future, for, you know, education aside, I I would love to have this. Well, first, I'd love it in a contact lens instead of this massive thing I put on my face. But yeah, that, um, I would love to be able to walk around the emergency department. And you know, have my patients' critical lab values displayed in front of my face instantaneously as they're resulted. And you know, I know the patient in, in room five has a potassium of six point two, and I need to go do something about that. And if I don't acknowledge that in you know the next five to ten minutes, it reminds me again, hey, you didn't go address the issue with the patient in you know room five. So uh, to to bring that information to you in real time, I think is massive and. From a you know, and we end up in our emergency department. We have 72 beds, and at any given time, you might be managing you know up to 10 critically ill patients uh, who are unstable, and another six or so who are relatively stable. And it's really hard to keep all of that you know tracked in your mind. And so, for Glass to take some of that burden off would be great. Do you think the benefit of of that being on Glass versus something else is the fact that it is in your view? It's the, it's the fact that I don't have to do anything to get the information. It comes to me. So a shot caller would work just as well. <laughs> as long as it told me what the lab values were afterwards. <laughs> Maybe you can call some SOS on you. I don't know how many of you have seen the posts about um, the development of contact smart technology, but uh, there are some companies working on that, and I'm quite excited and interested in seeing where that evolves as well. And I'm probably going to get smited for bringing it up in a glass discussion, but um, they're getting any, a little closer. If any of those companies are watching right now, give me a call. <laughs> I'm interested too. Well, they have some serious problems right now. Um, one company has managed to use nanotechnology to create a fiber that's flexible enough to put in the eye, but not necessarily comfortable enough. And they also don't have the power. Although I have a friend who has developed a nano tech battery, so um, if, I wish I could get those two together. <laughs> get a pair of contacts out of the deal. <laughs> but until then, this is what we're, we're with. How many of you have used the, the actual lenses? Oh, I've used them both quite often. Mm -hmm. For yeah. Some, yeah. I noticed Jason raised his hand too. Were, did you use it because it was like an eye protection in medicine or just because it's there and it's cool? Uh, I use I use them for a, an eye protection from from spill or splashes. Um, I do think it makes the glasses look a little bit more acceptable to the average person, but uh, I think they're so unacceptable in public, in my opinion, that I I I wear them at work only, and I really think that's where they're great in medicine because it's it's a tool. It's not a fashion statement. So, you know, you're wearing this as a tool for your job. I when I when I got my glass fitting. I took them off of my face and put them in the box when I left the building, and they were like, you're not going to wear those outside? I'm like, yeah, no, I don't think I'm wearing these outside. They're like, why not? They're a great conversation piece. I'm like, I'm a geek and all, but like my geek factor isn't that high. I can't wear these in public. I wear mine every day. I even have to recharge and put them back on. Well, you have hair. That's the difference. <laughs> like My 15-year-old son, who still sports the old school Bieber cut, like, uh, he looks great in them because his hair covers up, you know, half of what's going on there. For me, with the, I, I'm in the Air Force, so I have a military cut. You know, it's uh, it's just all out there for the world to see. 
Well, you see, you need some bling. See, I added bling to mine, so I'm I'm fashionably correct. Is, it, is that the exactly. dazzle? Huh? I thought they were extra sensors. sensors. Is that the first <laughs> bedazzled glass? I think I'm the first bedazzler. I do, but I also think um, I've been trying to convince Google. I think that it should be a headband with a rotating arm. <laughs> because uh. all of us put it, don't you put it up on your head sometimes to get it out of your way, especially if the battery's going low and you don't want to keep turning it on and off. And I found a really nice karaoke at REI that has a stretchable band and a little uh, thing that slides up on it and it just slips over the battery and sits on there really well. Really? So I just drop, it, drop them down, yeah. They're your readers. <laughs> well, I found that the yeah. sunglasses are nice. Just if anybody wants to know fashion-wise, I love going to the UT football games wearing my, my glasses, the actual sunglasses. You've noticed. <laughs> You've noticed? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't put them on the feet or anything, you know? Well, I think that we have discussed all that we can discuss until we have some products out there. I I know that some of you are working on some really cool things that you're not ready to talk about, and I hope that when you're ready to talk about them, you'll come back in a hangout and share them all with us and maybe use it as a, a launch pad for your product. Would that be possible? I, I think there's a little bit to talk about on Patrick's end. I yeah, haven't heard much I was going to say... I'd, I'd like to know a little more about um, where Patrick sees glass going and fire specifically. Um, you know, cause I know he's been using it uh, with his department, and you know he's had some time to kind of you know feel it out. So, you know, I'd like to yeah, hear okay. thoughts on on how that could go forward and what his ideas and uh, goals are there. Okay. Um, well. I didn't really have said much because it's more on the fire side than the medical side. For what I see, it's really useful for firefighters. Um, I see it useful as an initial response, um, just being able to have access to information really quickly, hands-free. Um, in its current form, you're obviously not be able to use this. Wearing an SCBA mask and going inside a structure is just not possible. But for the incident commanders and the safety officers on the outside who are uh, the ones ultimately making decisions. Um, this could be a great tool to access information. So most fire departments already have uh, data on the buildings and occupancies in their jurisdiction. So this would be a great tool to display that. And not what I've done so far is tie into our computer aided dispatch. So when we receive a call in a 911 center, it's uh, just sent out to glass, and what I see is the address of the call and the nature of the call and a small map showing the location and also the units that are being dispatched. Um, and so far, it's been pretty useful. I wear it most days, and... Um, It'll show up at this, about the same time as a dispatch, and oftentimes it'll even come in before it's dispatched on the radio, which is really <laughs> handy. <laughs> um, Do you use the navigation ability? Honestly, no. I don't. Um, I work in a city, and I pretty much know every street in the city. Uh, occasionally, I will I'll glance at the map just to get... Get, you know, in my head where it is. Um, but I can see for volunteer firefighters, uh, this would be really, really helpful. Um, that's the engine going out right now. That's, I'm on the ladder tonight, so I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> that's the ambiance of the hangout. The fact that you were still talking said everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would probably be gone. <laughs> so, I, just out of curiosity for you, you're the old day users out there, and I do most of my work is, is recording video. Those of you who are using it more kind of casually as a as a response system, like the nine one one calls, what kind of battery life are you seeing for your use? Um, anywhere between like four to eight hours. It really depends on how much I use it. Sometimes it's it'll be gone in four hours. 
I don't have to recharge. If I'm not using it much, then it lasts a little bit longer. Um, okay. It's definitely not all day. It's a lot. Yeah, that's. If I don't use it much, but I'm not taking pictures or doing any kind of voice searching or anything, it, it seems to last pretty decent. Yeah, I'm 30 minutes of video and my right ear is melting and my battery's <laughs> dead. <laughs> Snap. Yeah, battery life could, could definitely be improved. Well, since we've been talking, we had another person join us, so I'd like to uh, at least introduce Raphael Grossman. For those of you who don't know, he's he was the first surgeon to air live uh, surgery using glass. Did I get that right? Oh, I think your your sound is muted. When when people come in and there are a lot of people, it automatically mutes you, so you have to unmute. Yeah, that happens to me a lot. People mute me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, Kathy. It's great to be here. Sorry, I'm late. I'm I'm on call as usual, and and uh, but it's good. I I catch I caught the the last part of that that last conversation. So it's uh, it's great to be here. Well, we're talking specifically about glass in emergency medicine and some of the applications and, and some of the ways that it might be ultimately used. So do you have anything to chime in on as far as the applications of glass in emergency medicine? Well, you know, I, um, I'm, I'm, because I'm not a developer, I'm, I'm a big fan, I guess, of uh, using what, 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 what we got already. So uh, in, I, a minute ago, and the reason I was late, I was answering a call. As as most people you know might know, I'm I'm a trauma surgeon and an acute care surgeon, uh, and also an elective general surgeon in uh, Maine. And we cover two thirds of the state of Maine. And the area we cover is larger than uh, the area of Massachusetts, Vermont, and New Hampshire together. So at one particular time, when someone needs emergency surgical consultation or a consultation for trauma, only one surgeon covers the whole area. And tonight, that's me. So I just uh, it was uh, in a call, a, a video call through my through my iPhone with a hospital which is about 100 miles from here. They had a patient, uh, a young kid who was uh, cutting a tree with a chainsaw and went right through his foot, and uh, basically they wanted to to transfer him here to me to take care of him. And uh, I said, well, let me take a look because if it's just an isolated foot injury, really that'd be better served by an orthopedic trauma surgeon. So I told them to call the trauma. We have a transfer center which kind of triages all the calls to make it easy for the referring providers. And uh, so they contacted the orthopedic surgeon at our place and they said, oh, that sounds like plastic surgery, so why don't you call back? So they, I co I'm covering plastic surgery in a way tonight, so the call bounced back to me and I said, you know what, let's quit this uh, nonsense. Let me go see the patient. So I went in, I tapped and we are connected uh, to 15 hospitals via synchronous audio video connection through an through a encrypted medical grade application that we use that is called ClearC. So I was able to you know look at the physician, he told me what he had, then I talked to the patient, then I went and uh, managed remotely from my phone, I managed their camera 100 miles away and I was able to look in, you know, focus and I assumed that the wound, it was just a kind of a a simple, in a way, wound of the foot with some tendons cut and whatnot, certainly something that an orthopedic surgeon could take care of. So I called back uh, our transfer center and said to get the orthopedic on board to take the call, and, you know, we kind of fix the problem and triage that patient in a better way than bringing the patient here blindly for a patient who, you know, if they had a sort of a half-hanging foot in there, it might have had gone to... to need to go to a, to a center like in Boston or something. So by using a simple application and a Wi-Fi network for free, I, I was able to, to do better care and simple, uh, more simple care and, and less costly care. So there is no reason I couldn't have done that with glass, really, in a hangout, except that is not, you know, HIPAA compliant. But if the same app that I have here it could be downloaded for glass. It, you know, that would have been a great call, and I could have been, you know, eating an ice cream or something, you know, or 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 or, or uh, using both hands uh, without having to to use my phone. So I think that that is kind of an intuitive use for for glass. Use it for telemedicine. 
uh, I'm a big proponent of telemedicine in a mobile fashion and nothing more mobile than wearable. So uh, that's kind of my, my uh, you know, uh, pitch on that, I guess. I'd, I'd like to elaborate on that a little bit because I had a conversation this past week with someone uh, about their ER physicians and wondering if Glass had an application in extending their existing ER um, docs to be able to either get help or give help using Glass. Can you think of any specific ways that Glass is uniquely qualified to to enhance an ER physician's ability to treat other than just simply eating an ice cream or something? It, is it is it just because your hands are free? Like, are there times when you would still be treating patients while you're talking to someone else, or when you would like to tap into someone? Or I'm I'm just kind of playing around here because I really didn't have a lot to to offer that conversation. I thought maybe some of you could chime in. No, I think uh, certainly you you you, you want to be focused. I mean, if you are talking to someone through glass, you know, you want to be talking to them and not doing anything else. But uh, you know. In a way, I think that wearable is is better than than, than non-wearable, and uh, I think that mobile is better than than non-mobile. You know, if I didn't have my my smartphone set up to do mobile telemedicine, I would have had to go down to the station and find it, turn it on. You know, find the contact tap uh, is usually a little bit more cumbersome. Having it in a mobile fashion obviously is intuitively easier. But if I had it, you know, a, 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 in a wearable fashion, I don't even have to worry about it. I just say, okay, Glass, call X hospital, you know, X ER or X number in my contact list, and just immediately be. So the, I think the process would be much easier uh, rather than having to use my, you know, my cell phone and having to point it in front of me to, you know, for them to look at me, and then, uh, I, I, and if they had Glass, they could certainly be looking at the wound and not have to, you know go behind and try to find what, what, what so they would just look at the wound and through glass I could be seeing exactly what they are seeing. So it's a kind of bi-directional thing and many times we think about glass use with one glass but I think in medicine the potential, the power of glass is glass to glass. I really think that that's really big. Or like this kind of environment where we have multiple people on the call so specifically in ER Kathy I can see code situations really benefiting from glass specifically because if you have a care team that includes you know, EMTs acting as nurse techs or nurse techs, nurses, mid-level providers, you know, a resident and an attending, it's very easy that the attending in some you know, smaller hospitals may be somewhere sleeping on call and the mid-level is covering and if you know, complicated cases come in, you know, there's all sorts of different ways that they bring other people into the situation to try and mitigate costs in small facilities where they don't have patient volumes in order to keep, you know, those kind of people on staff. So you have to cut down. So in a code situation in a small hospital at night, sometimes say, you know, an ER provider might be covering the floor. So there's a code up on the floor where somebody's had a you know, sudden cardiac event. Um, they need to ping the doc in ER and say, hey, we've got a code blue up here. We need your help. So right now what happened is there's no communication that's going on from the time that you alert the doctor in ER until the time the doctor arrives on the floor generally. It's not like they hang on the phone with you the whole time because obviously they need their hands to open doors, operate elevators, and those kind of things. So glass specifically could be used in those kind of, um, you know, kind of critical access to hospitals um, where there's not the kind of staff resources that really should be in place to provide really effective and safe patient care. Um, I think there's huge opportunity there. Yeah. Well, I think that goes, you know, we have to really think about this and you know, we talk about emergency medicine and EMS as if it's, they're kind of one entity, but you know, I always think about EMS as there's urban EMS and there's rural EMS and those are com two completely different bears, you know. Uh, if you're talking to city paramedics in St. Louis, they can get to, to a level one trauma center from almost anywhere in the city in under 15 minutes. So a lot of what you would tell a rural paramedic to stay and play with, you're telling these guys to scoop and run with. And you know the same goes for a, a rural hospital where your emergency physician very likely isn't even emergency medicine certified. They're internal medicine or maybe they did an internship and never got certified in any, never did a, a boarded specialty. 
Uh, and, and these are the guys that are holding down the houses in these small little hospitals in rural Missouri. So, you know, they, they don't have even close to the knowledge base that you might have. And so something as simple as where we have your glass on your face and I'm going to talk you through reducing this trimalleolar fracture, which is an ankle fracture, a dislocation. And the longer that dislocation stays out and pulseless, the more likely you are to lose the limb in the end. So it's as, you know, as simple as really I'm going to pull hard on this in the direction of the angle and then kind of set it back on top of the ankle when you're done. It's not rocket science. It's really easy, but people are really paranoid to do it. So if you could have someone that had glass on their face and you just talk them through it, you could save somebody's foot, you know. So those are, you know, two different, comp you know, the same thing, EMS and EM medicine in two different spectrums. I would really like as an EMT to be in the field on a call and have direct access to medical control and they can see what's going on with my patient. I think that that would be great and to be able to talk real time with that information. That would that'd be great. Absolutely. And I've experienced other situations in small hospitals, um, kind of like he was just explaining about the foot where, you know, you can talk to somebody through it in the field. So um, in ERs a lot of times, uh, sometimes there's this real kind of break between specialities and say you have a respiratory therapist that's on staff. Typically in those kind of hospital settings, the nurses don't want to or are not required to give respiratory treatments. And so in a small critical acts hospital, you could have somebody who's coming in with difficulty breathing, you know, an acute asthma attack, um, things where they need um, nebulizer treatments mixed up, but a nurse is totally capable to do that. It's a very simple process. You put a few pieces of the uh, nebulizer together and you, you know, take the medicine and pour it in. Um, but lots of people are just afraid because that's not part of their daily routine. It's not something they do all the time. But if they were to have glass on and then link to the respiratory therapist who was paged that this patient came in, the respiratory therapist is en route, the nurse is able to mix with a little bit of direction from the RT, you've got patient care a little much faster. Um, can really split that whole process, I think. Well, I think we've talked uh, about some really great things here, and I look forward to having you participate in the Healthcare Glass Explorers community, all of you and continuing to post what you're working on and what you're developing and some of the examples that you have to share. And anyone who's watching uh, outside there, if you have any questions for any of these Glass Explorers, feel free to post them on the event page or inside the Healthcare Glass Explorers community. So I'm going to wrap it up for tonight and thank each of you for participating. Um, Chris Vukin and Jason Kruger and Jason Wagner and Patrick Jackson, and Raphael Grossman, and Ron McCready, and did we have anyone else that dropped out? I was thinking we had another one. Heather popped in. Oh, Heather popped in briefly, and then she popped back out. Whoa, goodness. Yeah. So um, thank you all for sharing, and um, I hope that you'll, you'll continue uh, sharing your experiences with all of us. This wraps up this the evening's Hangout, uh, talking about glass in emergency medicine. Thanks, Kathy.